it's my pleasure to introduce Rob McClure. Uh, Rob is currently a member uh, of the Milwaukee Aquarium Society in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, he has been keeping fish for over 35 years. Uh, Rob has uh, bred more than 100 species of aquarium fishes and currently maintains more than 50 tanks in a small basement room uh, where he focuses on um, Corydoras. Uh, and it, for the past eight years, he has managed to breed 70 species of Corydorinae, um, which is um, a pretty good accomplish. Uh, Rob was introduced to Corydorises or Corydori uh, when his father bought a few Julii catfish for his sister Julie. Um, and he was fascinated by their behavior. Um, and then when his local club had a breeding program, uh, he started breeding fish and he stuck with Corydoras because of their behavior, their, their ecology, and he just likes Corydoras. So without further ado. All right, thank uh, you very much. All right, so I'm gonna share my screen here. Uh, let's see, hopefully, let's see if this will work. And let's see. Oops. all right, can everyone see the, the screen here? Yep. Yep. Okay. All right. Sounds good. All right. So I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. Uh, as Anthony noted uh, in the, the, the uh, advertisement, I guess, on Facebook, we are going back to 2012 uh, in this talk. And uh, uh, I think it'll be fun to tell them about 2020. So I'm just kidding. <laughs> So uh, breeding Cory Doradne catfish, and this is a little bit of what has worked for me and what hasn't. Um, the, the interesting thing I think to state is that um, there are a lot of different methods. There's no right or wrong, um, but yeah, I, this is just my method and it has worked pretty well for me. Other people do different things and works well for them. Some of those things, you know, I'm sure would or, or could or in the past have worked for me, uh, but uh, for, for different reasons, and which I'll discuss, I don't use them anymore, or I haven't tried them yet. So, uh, so this is one way to do it, basically. <laughs> so, uh, so Cory Duradne, what is that? So Cory Duradne is actually uh, a subclass. It's not even really a, a class of fish or anything. So it's it's a subclass of the class uh, Calicthidae, Calicthidae uh, which in, you know kind of includes the Corridors and uh, their relatives and uh, the sometimes larger, mostly larger, uh, like fish like Calicthus and uh, I'm thinking of, Le Le uh, I'm trying to think of uh, some other names. They're, they're the, the Calicthene, I think they're, they're called. Uh, they're, they're larger, more armored or plated catfish. So uh, Cory Duradne is made up right now of Ascodorus, Corydorus, and Scleromystax. Brocus is scientifically, technically uh, placed into Corydorus right now, although in the hobby that has not really been accepted uh, and people still refer to Brocus as Brocus. So. <laughs> So a little bit about me. I think we kind of covered this uh, fun little uh, photo there that uh, the dead fish order in Winnipeg did uh, kind of a joke uh, poster they made of me based on Troy McClure of The Simpsons. So yeah, they, the whole he does the whole you may remember me from such films as and uh, so we had a little fun with that as it neat poster. So I kept it and use it in my talks. So. so getting ready to start breeding corridors. Here's a uh, weird dark photo of uh, Corridor's con color. But the point behind it is that you can see that the, it's a female fish there and she is holding an egg there in her uh, ventral fins. Uh, and that is that is how the female of all Corridoradne, uh, they, they deposit that egg in their ventral fins and uh, they, they usually mate with the males by using what they call a T position. So they kind of uh, go in a, you know, the mouth of the female comes and it touches the male kind of in midsection. Again, there's a lot of uh, debate as to how that works. Um, there, there 
was a paper that was kind of saying that they they drink the milt uh, and it goes through their digestive system before going to the eggs, but that seems to not make a lot of sense. Uh, so we kind of think maybe it, it's more of a, a suction motion that that pulls the milt you know, down the the lower surface of their body to their to their little egg pouch where they're holding those eggs. That seems to make a lot more sense versus drinking it and then and push, <laughs> pushing it all the way through their digestive system. In addition to that, with some of them, um, the process is extremely fast, specifically with long snout quarries. Uh, it's almost just a touch and go, and those eggs get fertilized. Uh, so I, I, I highly doubt that they're drinking it and, and pushing it through their gut. So. Uh, so choosing the aquarium, and I have a, a relatively small aquarium that I'm showing here, uh, which is, I think, important because a lot of times when you read things online, you you see things like, oh, you know, you need to have a 40-gallon aquarium to house 20 of these, and I can say that I've definitely bred more than uh, 20 species of Corydoradine catfish in a five-gallon aquarium, and while uh, I, while I can say that with some large species, you know, you have to be careful, you, you know, fish that produce more waste, they're larger, you have to feed them more, you definitely have to keep up on your water changes in a smaller tank like this, but I have a friend that has bred uh, Brocus splendens, which is definitely one of the larger species in a five gallon tank. I think um, something about putting them in closer proximity, uh, you know, kind of making them, you know, physically be closer to each other can can sometimes even be a part of the trigger. Uh, Ian Fuller, who's bred you know, well over 100 quarries, uh, most of his aquariums are very small in his fish room as well. Uh, it's, it's not a necessity to have small tanks, but I just would like to point out that it can be done. So, so for a substrate, uh, I prefer uh, silica or pool filter sand. Pool filter sand is a little hit or miss, depends kind of on where you get it. Uh, some of it can be kind of rocky and chunky, uh, but really what you're looking for is smooth, fine, fine sand. Uh, so the larger long snouted corridors like to dig almost eyeballs deep in the sand. Uh, so if you have like a rocky or a rough substrate, they can actually scrape themselves up and do a lot of damage. Uh, the, the smaller round snouted quarries uh, kind of feed off of the top of the substrate. And a lot of times they end up you know, sucking some of that sand in into their mouth and kind of pushing it through their gills. And I think what they're doing there is looking for microorganisms as they feed. But again, you know, you don't want anything too large or uh, sharp as as they're you know, using that substrate as a method of feeding. And uh, definitely not something where you want to use uh, jagged gravel or anything like that. Uh, sand is, we find works best and sand seems to be where we find them in nature. A friend of mine, uh, Jeremy Bosch, went to uh, Columbia multiple times now and uh, along with smooth river, river worn rocks, rounded rocks, uh, and um, you know some sometimes like a, a mulmy substrate of uh, you know, kind of de decomposing material, you often find corridors over light colored sand. So, and this is a, a quick picture of above the water, but it, it shows that there's that's where he found some quarries and they were over light colored sand. So, uh, so bare bottom tanks and why they're a bad idea. So here's a, it's a kind of a crummy photo. It's a cell phone photo for one of my old cell phones. Uh, but you can see that this uh, poor guy here uh, has had his barbels worn down to nubs. And uh, the barbels, I think, play a part in the breeding, specifically with the female fish. So you really don't want to have your fish in a condition like this where their their barbels have been kind of ground away. Uh, and this can happen from, you know, kind of sifting or trying to dig on rough substrate, can happen from bacterial infections too. Um, and I think that on bare bottom tanks, you're far more likely to get a bacterial buildup on the bottom of those tanks. And since the quarries are sitting on the bottom of the tanks and often, you know, trying to feed off of that surface, uh, if they get any scrapes or cuts or you know, are just sitting in that bacterial uh, filled bare bottom tank, they can get infections on their barbels and on their lower fins. Uh, one thing that I learned raising quarries, some of the first ones I raised were Corydorus metai, and at that point in time I was 
you know, kind of raising all of my fry on bare bottom tanks. And when I turned them in for my club's BAP program, some of the people who got them came back to me and said, Rob, you, you know, you, you didn't, I, they bought them from the club, but you know, you, you gave me fish that I can't breed. And I said, well, what are you talking about? And they showed me, you know, pictures. And one guy actually showed me the fish that their um, ventral fins where they hold the eggs were gone. They actually, you know, as they were developing and growing, they must have developed a bacterial infection sitting on those bare bottom tanks. And uh, with, with fins, with quarries, basically damage will kind of get repaired over time. But if that spine is gone or if that spine is destroyed by a bacterial infection, that fin won't grow back. So uh, that was a, a good lesson for me to learn pretty early on, you know, that uh, to move even even juvenile quarries to have a sand substrate so they're not sitting in that bacteria. I do talk to people who say, well, I have bare bottom tanks and I have no problem. And I can see it if you have really, really high flow that's kind of sweeping that substrate clean, or if you're going in you know, on a, on a every few day basis and cleaning the substrate, uh, cleaning that glass bottom, it could work, you know, but for me, I don't have that much time to do that on 50 tanks. So I, I keep a sand substrate on all my tanks. So. Uh, so filtration, uh, we'll go through a few different kinds. Uh, simple air-driven sponge filters. These are uh, classic in the aquarium hobby. Um, you do have to be careful with some of the, I, I have that showing with a long tube. Uh, some of the smaller, more narrow fish, uh, such, such as uh, aspidoras and some of the smaller quarries, I have unfortunately seen them get caught in that tube and not be able to make their way out. So sometimes I cut those tubes down. I've seen other people run the filters without the tube whatsoever, but I don't think that it provides uh, as, as good a filtration. So I in, when I'm keeping smaller or narrow bodied fish, I try to cut that tube on top down. Uh, but these are great filters. Um, they you know, collect a lot of good bacteria over time to break down the uh, ammonia and nitrites. And the other nice thing about these sponge filters is that you can kind of set one up in a tank and get it going. And then you can start a whole new tank that already kind of has a, a cycled sponge filter um, you know, just by moving that filter to a new tank. Uh, one other thing that I learned from Hans Evers, uh, who breeds a lot of corridors as well, and he travels quite a bit, is that uh, one thing that he does a lot of times before he travels, he'll take one of these sponge filters and squeeze them out in a fry tank. And that provides like kind of a lot of microorganisms before for the fry to feed on while he's gone. I've actually tried this and it's worked pretty well. If it's a really dirty sponge filter, you might be you know, cautious about it. You don't want to squeeze out too much mulm and garbage uh, into the bottom of your fry tank, but um, it does work. So it's pretty neat. So uh, matten filters are what I use in the bulk of my tanks. A lot of the smaller ones, I don't use these because they kick off a ton of current unless I'm trying to uh, provide a lot of current in that small tank. But anything 10 gallons or higher in my uh, fish room gets a matten filter for the most part. Uh, these are creating a huge wall of uh, biological filtration, you know, for and, and mechanical filtration uh, for your aquarium. They also provide a, a horizontal current uh, versus a vertical one like the other sponge filters, which is uh, more natural to the fish, you know, to have that horizontal water movement versus the vertical. Um, they in my experience, unless you're overloading a tank, they only need to be cleaned maybe you know, once every six months to once a year. Uh, they can go for a long time. And uh, they. I, I really haven't had anywhere I said, you know, I need to dispose of this. And I've had some of them for as, as long as seven, eight years now. So they, they kind of last forever, which is really nice. So. Uh, so hardscape, again, as I mentioned, no no rough or, rough or sharp edges. I stay away from things like lava rock or uh, some of the lace rock, things like that, that have a lot of jagged and rough edges. Uh, quarries are going to you know find a surface and they're going to go over it and kind of sift over it. Doesn't matter if it's wood or rock or whatnot, they're going to be looking for food. So they you don't want to find anything where they can kind of cut themselves up. So um, the wood, you know, it's kind of important to find something that's going to sink or at least pre-sink it so you don't have that floating wood in your aquarium. But a lot of the uh, bog woods that are available in the aquarium hobby, they sink right away, which is pretty nice. And this is a piece of Malaysian bog wood, which I use quite a bit of. They do add some tannins. Uh, so if you don't want the tannins, you may want to kind of boil them first. So. Uh, leaves and botanicals. Uh, botanicals have kind of become popular in the U.S. hobby. 
uh, I pretty much just use the free stuff. So I collect oak leaves, uh, white and red. I also collect uh, beech leaves, which are a little harder to find here in Wisconsin. Uh, if I do buy any leaves at all, I, I buy uh, some almond leaves, but I typically only add those at a rate of one per tank because almond leaves kick off a, a ton of tannins. So I try to reduce you know, how many I use unless I'm, again, trying to trying to add the tannins and darken up the tanks. So. Uh, so live plants, I try to include live plants in every tank. Uh, Java moss is a great one. I've had so many quarries put their eggs in Java moss. It can be a little finicky, uh, too high light, and you're gonna get a lot of uh, algae on your Java moss and too low, it'll get stringy and, and brown. So you got kind of get got to figure out the right balance of light uh, to make Java moss grow. But I use a lot of uh, floating or not rooted uh, plants. And I do that on purpose because with your stem plants, Corey's almost inevitably like to, to kick them up. So unless you're, you're dealing with really small stuff like uh, pygmy Corys or Hestatus, uh, Corys like to dig. So if stem plants are kind of, you know, if you enjoy replanting them all the time, go for it. But I try to stay away from stem plants and go with more floating or, or naturally, you know, kind of sitting on wood plants like uh, Java fern, Java moss, Anubias. Uh, Crips work and they, they tend to have a little bit of a bigger root body so they, they can't get kicked off as much. I also find that Crips will grow floating. So I use a lot of cryptocorins too. So. Uh, but, you know, hornwort I've used all different kinds. They're really nice because quarries do like to hide their eggs in them. And in addition to that, they tend to be a, a harbor for microorganisms, which I think all quarries kind of feed on to some extent. So, uh, so water. Uh, my most important things are obviously the water quality. Uh, so you, you don't obviously want to have ammonia and nitrites in the tank. Uh, the plants can help take up some of the nitrates. Uh, obviously, you want to shoot for low, low levels of each one of those. Um, temperature to me is something that I pay pretty close attention to. Um, some quarries are specifically a lot of the ones that are kind of middle of the uh, Brazilian uh, shield, I would say, or Brazilian area, uh, those guys typically will do better with slightly higher temperatures. Uh, in Fahrenheit, you're looking at the uh, 78 to 80, 82 range. Um, and in Celsius, I think that's about 25 degrees Celsius. Um, a lot of the ones from the uh, southern regions, so you're talking about Argentina, uh, Uruguay, and then the southeast coast of Brazil, which is a lot of fish I keep because I, I focus on Uh They have much cooler temperatures in nature, and uh, I try to keep the water temperatures around you know, 68 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, in in uh, Peru and Colombia, what you see is a quite a varying temperature. So they will have some warm temperatures, but then as the rains come and that cold water comes rushing off the Andes from snow melt, you'll see a temperature drop. Uh, so they that's a lot of the fish from Colombia and Peru. Uh, that's a great way to kind of uh, uh, trigger them. And uh, so you can keep them in the you know, higher 70s and whatnot, but I do recommend varying that temperature from time to time. I don't think that they do well uh, in, in a permanently warm tank for the most part. They'll, they'll kind of suffer in that. I've done a little bit of experimentation, particularly with aspidoras, uh, just probably because I've produced so many. And I have found that uh, trying to keep aspidoras in a, a, you know, pleco style tank that was about 82 to 84, uh, I ended up putting about 40 juveniles in and over time I lost almost all of them. Uh, and I think it was because of the high temperature. So they are not, it's not good to keep a lot of many quarries at a high temperature, uh, like in the you know, 82 to 84 range for a long term. For a short term, sure, no problem, but not over time. I don't think it's very good for them. Uh, pH, I use soft water. So the one thing you'll find with pH in soft water is that the pH will vary a lot. Even in smaller tanks, it'll vary week to week. It'll it'll drop, especially if you have a load. So I like to use TDS as a as a better measure for my um, tanks because TDS is kind of an electrical uh, you know reading. Uh, you know that's how it's obtained, and it usually doesn't change too much unless you get a lot of. Uh, 
uh, decomposing you know, material in your in your water. But if I if I put in uh, TDS water of about 120 parts per million, and uh, I have fish in there, and I have a load on the tank, and I go check it again in in two three weeks, uh, the pH will have dropped quite a bit, but the TDS remains the same. Um, so I I kind of use TDS more than than uh, pH. And uh, additives and tannins, uh, we'll get a little bit more into that as we get into the breeding, but uh, that can definitely change your, your pH, it can change the uh, TDS, and it can change the color of the water. So, uh, so selecting your breeders, um, here's just a few examples of uh, short round snouted quarries, which are ones that I think a lot of people start with, or, and they're, they're probably the most popular in the hobby. Uh, at the bottom there is duplicarious, and you can see, uh, and we'll get into that a little more, but the, the female's quite a bit larger, uh, both in length and in, in girth than the male who's on the uh, right there. So just to give you an idea. So if you're new to breeding quarries, some great, you know, First choices, uh, I started with Paleotis. Um, Paleotis is also known as the peppered quarry. Um, I find these pretty easy to breed in general. Uh, they're very widespread in the U.S. hobby. They're bred in, in Florida by the thousands. Uh, Corridorus Aeneas is the same way, uh, bred in Florida by the thousands. I have a photo here on the lower left of Corridorus Aeneas from the actual um, location where they were described, which is oddly enough, the island of Trinidad. Uh, so a lot of the Corridorus Aeneas and the Javi are coming from, there, there seems to be an Aeneas type in all areas of Brazil and Argentina, uh, Uruguay, Colombia, uh, Venezuela, Peru, they're all over the place. So they all, there's, there's a, a type that looks kind of like this fish. Uh, what's interesting is that they were described from the island of Trinidad, uh, which this fish actually came from the island of Trinidad. It's a, it's a wild caught. And uh, um, they, I can't see how that's necessarily genetically the same species considering the island of Trinidad has been separated from mainland uh, South America for 15,000 years at this point in time. But yeah, that there needs to be more research done on that to see uh, genetically if they're the same species anymore or not. So Corridor's Panda, a nice easy one. I will throw out a caveat. If you are trying to breed Corridor's Panda, stay away from adding other short round snouted Corridor's to that tank. Uh, Corridor's Panda seems to be one of the most frequently hybridized uh, quarries in the hobby. So I've seen uh, Panda trilidiatus, Panda sturbi, Panda white spin eye. Uh, they, they seem to hybridize with just about anything. They're, they're not too picky. If it's got a short round snout, they'll breed with it. So be careful with that one. But if you get a group of Corridor's Panda, they're relatively easy to breed and usually triggered by just a cold water change. Uh, both or all three of these that I've mentioned, that seems to be the, the trigger for them. It's pretty easy if you feed them good, get them in good condition and have a cold water change uh, that'll trigger them to lay eggs. Uh, Corridor's Habrosis is one of the small dwarf quarries. Um, so the reason why I state that it's a beginner, just to give you an idea, so a friend of mine's daughter picked up a group, I think, of three or four Corridor's Habrosis and kept them in her small plastic uh, pink tank with uh, some colorful sand bottom and actually found some fries. <laughs> so I think she was just feeding them flakes. So Habrosis, I, I found, uh, I, I kept a group of five Habrosis in a five gallon tank. They didn't eat their eggs. They didn't eat their fry. I had some Java moss in there, but not a ton. And I wound up with 60 that I ended up pulling out of that tank. They, they seem to be a really good beginner fish. Uh, and, and I recommend Habrosis as one that you really don't have to do much other than do your water change to take good care of them and feed them, and you'll likely find some more. Uh, Corridorus pygmaeus is the same way. A lot of people say Corridorus pygmaeus don't eat their their fry. Uh, I have found that not to be true. <laughs> I, I will I will say Corridorus pygmaeus eats some of their fry, but not all of them. So again, another one that you can keep and uh, you know in a tank, and and you will generally find fry as long as you're only keeping Corridorus pygmaeus. Uh, if you add larger fish of any kind, they're probably going to eat the pygmaeus fry. So uh, so just because it's common doesn't mean, it mean it's easy. So these two, uh, Corridorus sodalis uh, and Corridorus grantii, uh, which used to be Arcoatus, are pretty common in the hobby. 
So they, you know, show up in fish stores all over the place. Uh, as far as I know, they're all wild caught. Uh, so they're, they're being imported and, and in large numbers and they show up in the, the U.S. hobby at least quite a bit. Um, for Sodalis, um, I don't know if I've had very many people that I've heard of breeding these at all. Um, and then uh, Grant, I, I would say I can count the number of people on one hand that I know that have bred these fish. So they're common in the fish stores. Um, I don't think that they're commercially raised or whatever, they're being imported quite a bit uh, and they're, they're not easy. So be careful with just thinking, oh, I'm gonna buy these. They look like a common one. They should be easy to breed. Not necessarily true. So. Uh, some tips, tips on selection, definitely buy corridors and groups. Uh, it's, it's better for the fish uh, and they, they do better that way. Six or more is great if you can, if you can get them. Um, try if you can, and it's hard to tell sometimes in the stores, they're not always uh, in breeding condition and fed up real well. So you really can't always tell how how fat they will be once you get them into good breeding condition. But if you look at them from the top, you can see that uh, the widest point in the body of the male is kind of near the um, you know, uh, pectoral fins there or, or just behind the gill. Whereas with the female, uh, the widest point looking from the top is more so towards the midsection. Uh, males, uh, and you can kind of see a really good example of this with uh, Corydoras robustus here. The males have a, a much more pointed uh, ventral fin and uh, the females have a more rounded one. As I mentioned, they, they need to be able to clasp those eggs in a basket. So you'll see that. And then with the long snout quarries in particular, again, this is probably a um, more of a breeding condition thing, but you can see the pectoral spine on long nose quarries or long snout quarries, they get a much uh, fatter pectoral spine. Uh, in addition to that, some, some types have some sexual dimorphism, uh, specifically the elegans types. You're going to see a lot of uh, the males look different. They have a different pattern than the females. Uh, Scleromystex, uh, for the most part, that's a, 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 a given rule that the males are going to have longer uh, pectoral fins and perhaps a longer dorsal fin than the females. Uh, some of the quarry types too. I'll show some pictures later on that shows uh, kind of a male female difference with fin type or fin length, I should say. Also, uh, buy your group all at one time. Don't overspend. Um, so if you can't afford a group of six of them, don't say, I'm going to buy two now and buy two later. Uh, just because of the fact that if a store or a shop is importing fish or bringing in fish, uh, they may be getting them from different locations from time to time, uh, or they may be getting completely different fish and calling them the same thing from time to time. So try to buy them all at one time if you can. If you can't afford that group, maybe start with something a little less expensive. Most of the uh, easier to breed types are, are pretty inexpensive. Uh, feeding your corridors. So uh, we've got some uh, dry foods here um, and, and just a, a picture of that. That's a, a Sarah tablet. Uh, so I do feed some dry food, some crushed flake. I like to kind of uh, submerge the crust, cr crushed flake a little bit before I feed them so they sink. Obviously you need with corridors, you need to have foods that sink. Uh, so that's important. I use some pellets, I use some sticks, uh, tablets. I also use uh, freeze dried tube effects. Uh, and again, that's another one where they're dried out so they're gonna float. So you wanna kind of submerge them a bit so they sink. I, I kind of submerge them and squeeze them and get them to absorb a bunch of water. Uh, frozen foods I feed, um, some, uh, you, have, you have to be a little careful with the frozen foods, uh, not too much. I've had some problems specifically with uh, feeding too much frozen bloodworms and frozen daphnia. Um, they, for the most part, I think they're good for the quarries, but I think you can kind of overdo it. And I think with those frozen foods, uh, generally speaking, the ones that are for our fish have kind of a hard chitinous shell, whether it's the bloodworms or the, the daphnia and uh, giving too much of that, you know, kind of frozen, dead, hard bodied animal to the quarries, I think can give them digestive problems. I have had some instances where I fed too much frozen food and seen some losses. Uh, black worms here in the United States, and I think they're starting to spread to other uh, areas where people are, you know, keeping tropical fish. Uh, these are these are kind of the the magic food, so to speak. So black worms are great uh, spawning trigger. 
Um, I think if you can't get a hold of black worms, then uh, white worms or uh, you know mosquito larvae can also play a same you know same type of role. Um, mosquito larvae, be careful. Obviously, uh, whatever the corys don't eat is eventually going to turn into a mosquito, so be careful of that. Uh, everyday care. So water changes. I do. I try to do water changes 50% on each tank every week. It's a goal. You know, it's not a, necessarily a rule, but uh, I, I find that really important for their overall health. Uh, monitoring the temperature and conditions. Uh, we talked a little bit about that before. You want to try to match the temperature and conditions the best you can with where the fish are coming from. Uh, so do a little research. Uh, there's some great websites out there, Corridors World, uh, Planet Catfish, as well as Facebook, you can get a lot of information uh, from different people who have kept and collected these fish as to what kind of conditions they're coming from and you wanna to try to match this. Uh, the fish I've got shown below here is Sclermistax macropterus. Um, so this is a fish that, you know, if you you know just get it at first, it can be kind of dull and, and blah. And after getting it in, in the right conditions, you can see it can develop into quite a beautiful uh, and interesting looking fish. Um, this fish has really specific conditions. I had bred them once in 2018 and never got them really to breed again after that. I, th I think, again, maybe two or three people that I know have, have really ever bred and recorded their results on this fish. It's not commonly bred. Uh, but I had talked to a friend of mine who lives in Sao Paulo where these fish occur. And I showed him a little video uh, just on the phone of my Sclermistex macropterus tank. And he said, Rob, Rob, this is not right. Yeah, you know, the, uh, this fish comes from water that's dark as Coca-Cola. Yeah, it's, it's not a clear water fish. Uh, so shortly after that, I made some, some changes and put a lot of tannins into that tank. And not only did I get them to breed again, but I got them to breed repeatedly. Uh, and they, they developed this nice finish, nice coloration, uh, got really healthy. So now I know, you know, kind of how to breed that fish, which is, you know, to add a lot of tannins, which is mimicking their natural environment. Uh, condition includes and, and growth. Um, yeah, we kind of mentioned that. I'll go into a little more detail on the food as we go forward. But one thing to note is that a lot of stores sell corridors as scavengers, and they are really not. Uh, they're uh, you know, micro predators. They'll go after worms in nature. They'll go after uh, insect larvae, uh, microorganisms, um, small little water living creatures. They are not they're not uh, omnivores. They don't graze on plants or anything like that. Um, and, they're, and they definitely don't eat fish poop. So it's some, any store that tells you, you need a cleaning crew like Corridor, it's a bad idea. Uh, I, I can see why maybe that rumor had started or, or that idea had started because uh, poop, you know, fish poop can look a little like a worm. So the quarries might, you know, put it in their mouth, but they're not going to eat it. You know, they, they, once they figure out what it is, they're like, yeah, that's not a worm. I don't want it. So, uh, so you have to be very careful. And, and the other thing, if you're keeping quarries in a community tank is you want to make sure that some of that food is getting down to the bottom uh, for your quarries. So if you're feeding all floating foods or top, you know, top based foods, uh, your other fish might be getting those and, uh, quarries are not. So you want to definitely look for something that sinks. Uh, try to stay away from, you know, kind of the algae, sinking algae pellets and stuff like that. The quarries may eat them, um, but that's not really their natural diet. It's not necessarily good for them. Uh, try to find sinking foods that are uh, more small animal based, and that's that's what you're looking for for your quarries. So live foods are great. I hatch out baby brine shrimp every day and feed that to every tank if I have enough. Um, as I mentioned, worms, uh, even microworms, even my adult quarries will eat some microworms. Um, these are all good things for your quarries, and they are definitely much more attracted to live foods than than uh, frozen or or solid. I feed some rapashi, but uh, rapashi to me is better for your uh, fish that can scrape off of that, like your plecos and some of the cichlids. Uh, it it works, but for quarries to eat rapashi, they've kind of really got to wait till it breaks down. They can kind of suck a little bit off the top of it, but uh, quarries, the way that they feed it usually is by, you know, filter feeding kind of mic for microorganisms. As I mentioned, they suck up the sand and kind of flush it through their gills, or they, they suck up their foods and eat it whole. So, you, you know, ideally you want to try to find something that'll break down to the point where they can 
uh, eat it, you know, as as it's kind of crumbling and be able to ingest it or something small, small enough so that they can swallow it whole. They don't have great teeth. Um, so they, you know, they do have a little bit of, you know, teeth, but they don't have anything where they can bite off chunks of things. So they've kind of got to rely on um, sucking, sucking in pieces that are small enough to fit in their mouth. So I do repashi occasionally. Uh, and they do, you know, they, they're attracted to it and they go after it, but I think they're only getting little bits at a time and it's harder for them to eat it. So, uh, spawning triggers. So this is the one that everybody, you know, likes, as I mentioned, uh, we'll talk about the cooler water changes. This is, uh, an interesting story. So I, I got those, uh, you know, true Aeneas uh, from, they were imported from the island of Trinidad and everybody says, you know, Aeneas, that's an easy one. And I had those for almost two years and no spawns. Um, I had bred, you know, Florida raised Aeneas multiple times. They were a piece of cake, but these, these true Aeneas, you know, I, I tried all different kinds of things and I was not getting them to breed. And uh, sure enough, I, I was probably overthinking it. And one day I said, well, why don't I try a, a cooler water change and just see what happens? So I, they were at about 72 degrees Fahrenheit and I drained uh, about half of their tank, so 50%. And I added in water that was much, much cooler, uh, 55 degree water. And bam, the next day, hundreds of eggs. So sometimes, you know, I, I even as, as I've gotten into these quarries that are much more difficult to trigger or breed, I, I just wasn't even thinking about the good old standby, a cooler water change, and that did the trick. So uh, adding live food. So if you've been feeding, you know, pellet based food or flake food or, you know, even rapashi or, or frozen foods for a long time, sometimes adding those live black worms or, or you know, something like live daphnia, um, other kinds of live worms can be a spawning trigger for them. So that's a, a great way to trigger them. Uh, one way that I do it is a lot of times if I'm having, you know, kind of struggling with it is that, you know, they're, they should be breeding. They look like they're in breeding condition, uh, but they're just not there yet. I either do a massive tank cleaning, you know, with multiple water changes, you know, clean out all the filters, uh, you know, just, just get it like it's brand new, or I just move them to a newer, different tank. Uh, and that seems to be a spawning trigger with a lot of different species that I'm kind of struggling with. Um, sometimes having another species, and you have to be careful with this because you obviously don't want to have um, two quarries spawning in the same tank that are, uh, you know, could, could cross. Um, but uh, that, that's a whole nother talk to talk about which ones can cross and which ones can't. But so having another species spawning in the same water, uh, I have in the past even used dividers. So I've had one species kind of spawning in one chamber and another species spawning in another chamber, but it's a, it's a mesh divider. So they're in the same tank. Uh, that, and, but I'll take a species that is spawning put and put it into one side and put, take one that's not put it into another side. And I think there's something with the you know, pheromones of the water uh, that get the other spe other species that may not be spawning, you know, they're seeing, well, this this guy on the other side spawning, they're kicking off some breeding pheromones, and it can actually, I think, trigger uh, that non-breeding species to, to start spawning. So um, one thing I've seen like in a community tank is if you have a whole bunch of fish in the tank and you remove all the fish except for the breeding group of quarries from the tank, sometimes I think that that can trigger them to spawn. They just get you know, frustrated. There's a lot of activity. There's a lot of fish that are uh, you know, taking up resources. And if you remove those fish, they're like, hey, it's all just us now. This is fantastic. Let's breed. So the conditions just got a lot better and they'll breed. I've had this happen uh, many times and sometimes with some difficult to spawn species like the uh, CW127 or super parallelists as they were uh, given the hobby name. I've actually done that twice with them now where I've kept them with other fish and then removed that other fish, did a water change, and then the CW127 spawned. Um, storms, something to keep an eye on, low pressure systems and moon phases. Uh, so when I say moon phases, I've noticed particularly with mine uh, during the full moon and the few days around the full moon and the no moon, when there's no moon and a few days around the no moon, I see spawning activity pick up quite a bit in my fish room. Uh, it's just something to pay attention to. I'm not saying it's necessarily a trigger, but it seems to be have an effect. So <laughs> it's just anecdotal at this point. So um, adding tannins, we talked about that with Sclerimus X macropterus. Slow water changes. A friend of mine does uh, a weird technique where he drips water out using airline tubing and a little airline valve. Uh, so he does a real slow 
drain on his water uh, over the, you know, the course of like an entire day, uh, drains it down to half and then adds the water back slowly. And he's gotten fish to spawn like that. Um, adding current, uh, another really interesting thing is to kind of keep them in still slow moving water uh, for a few weeks and then you know, maybe throw a power head in there, add some current uh, or, or you know, kind of alternate between more current and less current. Uh, a lot of people have gotten some difficult to spawn species uh, to spawn by doing that. So, and the, the dry spell, which is written about you know, quite a bit in Ian Fuller's books and, and uh, Hans Evers uh, really lives by this dry spell idea. I have tried it a few times. Uh, Hans particularly is way more gutsy than I am. He'll, he'll keep uh, these fish in the quote unquote dry spell where the water level is very low, water movement is almost nothing. Uh, there's very little filtration and you feed them very little. Uh, he'll keep them in, in those conditions for months uh, and then suddenly you know, fill the water back up, get water movement going, filtration going and add a bunch of live foods and bam, they spawn. Um, in my experience, it's probably, you know, if I have a species that I am having trouble spawning with, generally speaking, I spent a lot of money on it. And I, I usually do a dry spell for a few weeks and then kind of give up because I'm afraid I'm going to kill them. So, <laughs> so this is one of the methods that works for other people. Uh, and maybe just because I, I haven't gotten that gutsy yet, it, it hasn't worked well for me. So, <laughs> uh, so real quickly, my corridor is laid eggs. Yippee, now what do I do? So this is what I do. Again, this is how I've had success. May not be uh, how other people have success. Uh, I, can, I can give you the reasons as we're going. So what I do is I collect uh, the eggs by hand, a few numbers of species or a few numbers of uh, types or species that we mentioned. Um, you don't have to do that. So pygmaeus, hebrosus, astatus, you can kind of leave the eggs where they are and you're gonna wind up with some fry. They just don't really predate or eat uh, all of their eggs or all of their fry. So you're gonna find some, uh, specifically if you've got some plant mass in there, they're gonna, the fry are gonna be able to hide in there. Uh, so I use a specimen container. So I get one of these uh, one liter specimen containers about and I collect the eggs by hand um, and put them in the specimen container and I add an air stone with moderate aeration. I don't wanna see the eggs flying around in the container. I just wanna see a little bit of water movement from that air stone. Uh, and, and I think that that helps keep the eggs free of debris. I also add uh, one or two alder cones. Um, these can be ordered nowadays uh, online. You can find them quite a bit. Uh, they're uh, a small, pine cone like thing from the alder tree, which is not a pine, it's actually a broadleaf plant. Uh, but these alder cones kick off quite a bit of tannins relatively quickly. And what those tannins do is they coat the eggs with kind of this, this brown tannin coating, which prevents them from fungusing. Uh, and even if they do, you know, fungus, you can have one egg that's stuck to another. So you have one that fungus and the other egg that's stuck to didn't fungus and it doesn't really spread from one egg to another. Um, all eggs which are kind of uh, unfertile or the fry dies within the egg, you know, they're gonna kind of fungus eventually, but the alder cones do a really nice job of preventing that and preventing it from spreading, so. Excuse me, sorry. Um, so after I add the alder cones, I let that sit for about 24 hours. And um, yeah, the water starts to look like this. Uh, so after 24 hours, I pull the alder cones out and then um, start you know, the, the very next day doing 50% water changes with water from the, the breeding tank water. So you kind of, you know, you've coated the eggs now, you want to start removing those tannins. You don't necessarily want the fry to hatch in that tannin heavy water. So I start doing daily water changes on the egg container with breeding tank water so that by the time they do hatch, the water is the same consistency as the breeding tank. Uh, so day one on this egg here, you can see Zaspidorus fuscogatatus. You can see you're not seeing much. <laughs> so these are actually eggs that I, I did not you know, stain with tannins. So these ones I kept uh, completely in just clear water, uh, just so we could get a better idea of what, what that looks like. It would be harder to see through the egg if it was stained with tannins. Uh, day two, again, you know, not much going on. You might see a little 
uh, blob inside the egg. Uh, by day three, it's it's pretty well developed. Uh, you can see the eyeballs even of the fish that's all coiled up in there. And by day four, you can see the egg shell is starting to to wear down and weaken. Um, I, I actually watched these guys hatch under a microscope and it was pretty interesting. So they start to kind of wiggle back and forth and flex their body. And eventually, usually it's, they, they kind of just go from this tight little ball to boom, you know, they expand and that breaks that thinned eggshell uh, on the sides. And uh, usually it's the tail that pops out first. So one thing I will notice or note to you all is that I use a, a turkey baster both to do my water changes on my egg containers. And I also, if I see them kind of stuck like that where it's just the egg with a tail and they're kind of really struggling to get out, I'll suck up the eggs in a turkey baster and kind of push them out. And a lot of times just doing that a couple of times will help get them you know, free from the eggs if they're kind of stuck. I'm kind of adding this unnatural you know, coating to the egg, this tannins, which I think may be causing them to um, you know, have trouble hatching. So I think it's only fair then that I, I give them a little help with hatching. Uh, the fish that I have uh, done without adding the tannins in there, without adding the alder cones, I noticed that they almost never get this situation where they're uh, an egg with a tail. So uh, I think that's a result of adding the tannins. It's great protection. It stops the eggs from going bad. But the, you know, the kind of the bad part about it is that I think those tannins kind of make it a little harder for them to break out of the eggs. So I keep that turkey baster handy and I help them hatch a little bit. So, uh, so after hatch, uh, just some uh, macro photos of what they what they kind of look like after hatching and, and about one week old. Uh, you can see that they have that yolk sac. So I uh, will get into the, the feeding of them in a minute, but that yolk sac, they're going to live off of that for, for three days after they hatch. Uh, you can see that in the uh, Meti photo there. They've got kind of that big yellow yolk sac. So. Uh, so what and when to feed with your fry. So I don't feed them for three days after they hatch. I might change the water and remove some of those eggshells a little bit and try to keep it clean, but I don't feed them for three full days. Uh, after three days, usually their, their yolk sac is absorbed and I start to feed a tiny little bit of microworms uh, one to two times a day. Uh, if, you, if you're in the hobby, uh, at least in the US or uh, UK, I believe in, in South Africa and Australia, um, Europe, you should be able to find breeders with a, a kind of a starter culture of microworms. They're actually, uh, I don't think they're a worm. They're actually like a, a flat, uh, kind of like a planarian, you know, like type of flatworm type of thing. But they're they look like tiny little worms, and they're very easily cultured. Uh, a lot of aquarists culture them, and uh, you can you you can pretty much you know feed them on uh, baby oatmeal, and they'll you know multiply by the probably the millions. So I keep a few of those microworm cultures around. Uh, and for the, the first three days that I feed my quarries, I just use just on the tip of my finger, just a tiny little bit of microworms. That's enough. I, I kind of you know, gather it from the side of the microworm container and dip that into the feeding uh, or dip it into the, into the uh, specimen container to feed them. And it kind of spreads them all around. They will live in water uh, for not forever, but you know, usually for a number of hours. So it gives them a live food, which gets them attracted. And and, uh, it gives them some protein. Um, I try to do it you know, one time a day if it's a small amount that's hatched or two times a day if it's a larger amount. And I do water changes in between every feeding, you, again, using uh, that turkey baster and water from the breeding container to just keep it clean. Um, so in most cases, six to seven days after they hatch, I try to give, start giving them freshly hatched baby brine shrimp. And that's really nice because you can see their bellies. They get that nice orange belly. And uh, I think I have some photos of that going forward. Uh, let's see. Oh, maybe not. So, <laughs> uh, this is uh, growth and getting the best results. So uh, just just giving you an idea, you know, so that they they grow and they develop that adult color pattern. Usually, you know, starting at about two three months. Um, 
But you know, I feed I, you know to, to keep going forward from that feeding. After I get them started on the um, baby brine shrimp, I move them to a, a, a tank. Usually, I try to try to move them to a five-gallon tank with the sand substrate, getting them out of that uh, specimen container, and I feed them with baby brine shrimp every day until they're you know probably about this one-month age or sometimes a two-month age, where I think they're big enough to start handling some crushed flakes and some uh, you know maybe some crushed pellets. Uh, if you can't get a hold of, or, or if you're worried about hatching baby brine shrimp or can't get a hold of it, I've heard of a lot of people using decapsulated baby brine shrimp eggs, or brine shrimp eggs, I should say, uh, which and, and achieving the same results. So, you know, that's one thing to look into. Uh, so just real quickly, some fish I'm currently working on, uh, Sclermistax prionotus. Uh, Sclermis X macropterus, as we kind of talked about that one a little earlier, I actually just got another spawn from these guys after adding tannins to their aquarium uh, on Thursday night. So. Sclermis X barbatus and CW147. Uh, CW38, C113. Um, we're pretty sure this is the same fish at this point. Uh, they come from Bahia uh, on the east coast of Brazil. Um, there's, uh, unfortunately, they've been kind of given two numbers, so C113 and CW38. Uh, that was done by Hans Evers and Ian Fuller, and the, both those guys have kind of backed off of that now and said they don't think it's anything different, so. Uh, Aspidorus Raimundi albino uh, used to be called C125 gold in the UK, C125 red in Germany. Uh, recent work, uh, scientific work has kind of found that C125 is actually Aspidorus Raimundi. So I'm calling them you know, Aspidorus Raimundi albino. <laughs> so. Uh, so this is the big one. A lot of uh, Anthony said a lot of people ask questions about CW111, uh, and I'm happy to answer questions about that after the talk. I was able to obtain the much cheaper but yet very closely related uh, CW146. I haven't been able to breed these yet, but they're getting close. Uh, they're they're very very similar to the CW111, and, and we think that they live in the same area. Uh, so a really cool looking, interesting fish. So. Uh, C-115, C-116, another one where they kind of gave it two numbers, then they later on decided it was the same thing. So C-115, C-116 come from the Madre de Dios region of Peru. I was able to get a wild caught group of these, uh, I think in December. And uh, unfortunately I got six and I'm down to four left, but thankfully on Thursday night, I uh, collected about 12 eggs from them. So hoping that I can get them, get them going and uh, they will have a, a name soon. I actually uh, worked with the scientist that uh, is describing them to kind of do a little bit of proofreading on the description. So these will be uh, named species soon and then we can not worry about calling them C-115 slash C-116. So that should be anytime now, it, it, they'll be a named species. So. Uh, Corridorus microcanthus, which I got from Hans Evers, really interesting species. Hans collected this in about uh, 50, 55 degree Fahrenheit water in northwest or maybe north central Argentina. So definitely one of the coldest dwelling uh, corridors, at least for some times a year. I've talked to a few people in Argentina and they say it's not like that all times a year. It's not always you know, like 55 Fahrenheit. It gets warmer in the summer months, but interesting that they're able to tolerate that. I've been able to breed these. Uh, they're very Aspidora looking, uh, but what we found is that the, one of the primary differences between Aspidoras and Corridors is that Corridors have this cool ability to lock their pectoral fins out. So if they're you know, kind of being swallowed, they can actually lock those fins out and form kind of like a little T, you know, with their with their fins. And that jabs the mouth of a, a fish that's trying to eat them. Yeah. And Eric talked a little bit about that in, in his uh, talk last week. Well, these microcanthus while they look like an aspidora, they can actually lock their spines out like that, whereas aspidoras cannot. Uh, they don't even have the physical you know, um, ability or mechanics to do that. So this is not an aspidoras. It is a corridors, even though it looks quite a bit like an aspidoras. Uh, another one is uh, I'm working on is corridors griffis. Uh, and I've got probably about uh, 50, 60 fry of those going right now. Uh, I'm getting a lot of... Uh, requests for that one. So <laughs> trying to breed as many as I can. So. Uh, 
Uh, neat one I picked up from uh, a breeder in Norway, uh, Corridors Pygmaeus albino. Uh, they've been kind of a difficult to breed. I, I started with six and I'm up to uh, I think about 16 now, but I'd really like to, to get a lot of them going before I start spreading them in the U.S. hobby. Um, I think they'll be kind of popular. Uh, Corridors Carolite, uh, another one I picked up in the U.K. Uh, it's it's a dwarf species, so I, you know, with all the nanotank craze, uh, I would think that these would be a really neat one. This is the biggest one I have, and it's, it's I've had it for five years now, and it's maybe an inch and a half. So they're, they're a neat, you know, pretty easy to breed little dwarf species um, from uh, southeastern Peru. Or, I'm sorry, it's Peru. Southeastern Brazil, sorry. <laughs> and a couple uh, CW163, uh, which uh, we thought was a new species, but uh, I was working with a scientist on it. I was able to get him uh, 20 of these to examine. And uh, he says it's too close to Canii. Uh, to, to call it a new species. Uh, but Ian and Hans, I got some to Hans Evers uh, back in 2019 and they decided to give it a, a CW number at least. So it has a new CW number, uh, CW163. Uh, and uh, CW139, this is one of the, as I mentioned, one of the Aeneas types. So um, it's, it's from Suriname, not from Trinidad. Uh, again, Ian gave it a a number CW139, but without a lot of scientific work, uh, most scientists will probably consider this uh, Aeneas. Uh, as far as I know, I'm the second person uh, in the world to breed, I'm uh, the first person in the world to breed CW163 and the second person in the world to breed uh, CW139. Uh, one of the, um, uh, I can't remember, oh, Werner Seuss, uh, one of the very famous German aquarists who wrote some books, uh, bred CW139 quite a while ago, but it seemed to disappear from the hobby. I was able to get a few of these uh, two years back, imported from Suriname, and I have gotten them to breed. Uh, they are definitely, they don't breed like Aeneas. They're much more difficult. They eat their eggs. Uh, only got them to really breed good once. So it's, it's, a, it's a difficult Aeneas type, so. And that's pretty much it. So thank you very much. I'm looking forward to answering your questions. Uh, I'll stop the, the screen share and hopefully I didn't go too long. So, oh, <laughs> so uh, you, went, you know, we yep, know, yep. we know fish people. Oh, I did go too long. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, we, I should have set a timer. <laughs> we still have time to uh, yep. ask some questions. So I have some questions here that have been mm -hmm. asked. Um, uh, First couple are from Matt Kaufman. Um, mm -hmm. First is um, any concerns that the sand you use in your tanks might uh, impact the water hardness or the pH? Uh, no. Uh, so I use 100% uh, silica sand, which does not uh, alter the, the hardness or pH. You do have to be careful to find uh, sand that that doesn't do that. Yeah, so you know, I've seen sand offered for rift lake cichlids, and that will definitely alter the pH. Uh, you know, aragonite sand definitely will alter the pH. So you do have to be careful and choosy about the sand uh, that you find. 100% uh, silica sand is is a good one because it does not alter the pH. So. Uh, also, uh, can you describe how you clean your matten filters? Do you just squeeze sure. them into fresh water? Um, and do you get a metabolite spike uh, when the filters are put back into the tank? Uh, so I, when I clean the matten filters, I actually take them out of the tank uh, and run, you know, like the hose or uh, or a uh, just the the faucet over them real hard. You know, just try to flush out as much of the uh, dirt and you know, detritus as I possibly can. Uh, I try not to squeeze them too much because you can kind of damage the cells of the sponge. Uh, so I'm trying to just flush them as best as I can. Uh, it takes a while usually, um, but after removing them from the tank, yes, there is a ton of uh, mold and whatnot that, that, you know, comes in the tank. So generally speaking, what I do is remove the fish during that time and I do multiple, multiple water changes, try to get as much of the mold out as I can and put the uh, matten filter back in at that point uh, and set it up before putting the fish back in. So I try to clean out the tank really good. Uh, the As I'm cleaning them out, 
I don't think I'm destroying all of the bacterial population, the good bacterial population in them. So I don't know, I don't normally see a uh, spike in anything really. It does, uh, it, it's pretty easy and nice. Uh, in addition to that, I often keep a sponge filter and a matten filter in the same tank and typically only clean one at a time. So okay. yeah, kind of takes over. So. Um, when you um, do water changes and such, uh, how much does the pH drop? And would you expect to lose fish that way, depending mm -hmm. on how far you are? And to piggyback off that, um, Steve Firestone wants to know, you know, if you drop the temperature too much, mm -hmm. is there a point where you get it in some of your fish? Ah, that's a great question. Okay, so um, let's start with, uh, uh, so as I'm as I'm personally doing water changes, I am not dropping the pH. <laughs> I am actually raising it. So my tap water is relatively hard. It's uh, seven point nine. Uh, my TDS is about three hundred parts per million. Uh, so I actually have to kind of cut my water with RO. So I use fifty percent RO and fifty percent tap water when I do water changes. So that moves the pH to about seven point three and the TDS to about one hundred fifty parts per million. Um, so most of my tanks as I've let them sit for about a week with that relatively low TDS, and um, most of them being smaller tanks, uh, the fish waste and whatnot drops the pH to usually in the sixes. Uh, if I've really let it go and let it go for two weeks or three weeks, sometimes I see the pH drop into the fives over time. So generally speaking, when I'm doing water changes, I'm raising the pH because I'm putting pH water pH 7.3 in there. Um, corridors, are, for the most part, are really, really tolerant to pH changes. Um, they are not like some of these sensitive, you know, uh, snowflake fish that if you do a pH fish or pH change, they're going to croak. Uh, they can handle pH changes better than a lot of a lot of fish. Um, I really haven't seen a situation where I have done water changes and lost fish. Um, as far as how cold you can go, um, generally speaking. As you're doing these cold water changes to try to trigger the fish to, to spawn, I would recommend you know, trying to you know, do the math and drop the, drop the temperature tank. First start off by dropping it by about five degrees, then maybe 10, uh, then maybe 15. Uh, and I, at 20, you're getting kind of dangerous there. So you can add water into the tank that's 20 degrees colder than you know, the, the water that's in the tank, because that's that's just going to drop it. If you do a 50% water change and you're adding water that's, you know, 20 degrees colder, it's going to drop the tank temp by about 10 degrees. But, you know, you, you kind of got to figure it out and, and do the math. And obviously you don't want to add water that's uh, right, right above freezing into the tank, at least not too much of it, you know, because, yeah, you could definitely do some damage. So, so um, no problems with ick, though? Uh, I actually have never seen ick in corridors. So I, I, it may be because they um, are plated versus scaled fish or whatever, but I've actually, I've kept almost 200 kinds of quarries and I've never seen a spot of it, so. Okay. Uh, Renee wants to know, she asked this in Spanish to me. So mm -hmm. um, she wants to know, how does photo period affect the breeding cycle? Given that, you know, some of these corridorses aren't right there along the equator. So there is not the normal 12-12 um, you know, nighttime, daytime cycle. Yeah, that's really interesting. And then you will also find that some of them spawn more often lights off and some of them spawn more often with the lights on. Uh, so I haven't done a lot of research into that. Uh, I actually was trying to do the 12-12 for a while, but I found in my tanks that that caused um, too much algae growth. Uh, so, you know, just for less work for me. I've now cut the photo period down to about eight hours a day. And I really haven't seen a decrease in spawning per se, um, but I haven't done a lot of research into, uh, you know, how, how changing the photo period affects them. So it would be an interesting project to research. So okay. For sure. Another series of questions from Matt again. Mm -hmm. um, is there any natural light in your fish room? Yeah, there's uh, a little, you know, little otherwise the moon phase would not matter in terms of light, but the moon phase will have other effects on your fish. Right, yeah. So there's a, I do have, a, uh, it's a, in the basement, but I do have some windows that are open, you know, to the, at least uh, the light coming from outside. Um, so yeah, they do get some natural light. Um, I, I think 
the reason I started paying attention to the moon phase was because of a bass uh, fisherman that told me that bass spawn much more often when there's a no moon or a full moon. And he was the one who told me to pay attention to it. And I think his thinking behind it was more of a gravitational pull versus a, um, yep. uh, versus a lighting. So, yep. yeah. Yep. So. Um, Matt again wants to know why not use uh, methylene blue? Ah, great. Yep. And I should have, uh, instead of the, yeah. the alder cones, because who knows where these alder cones come from and who knows what they may bring into your system. And right. you'd use the same alder cones for multiple hatches or a new alder cone. For no, no, yeah, new one every time. Yep. Yeah. Because once you've used it, uh, or once it's sat outside, you know, too, if, if you gather alder cones, usually in the spring or summer, uh, they're, you're gathering the dried up ones and they've seen a whole year's worth of rain and snow and whatnot, so they tend to lose their tannins. Uh, so I like to collect the alder cones in the fall. I like to collect them from the tree and not the ground. Uh, so that way I'm avoiding getting anything, you know, that unsavory on them. I also like to collect them from areas where uh, it's more natural and I know that they don't spray. You know, I, I'm looking for a spot where uh, they're not spraying for bugs or pesticides or anything like that. So these are all things that I do keep in mind. Um, I use alder cones instead of methylene blue, and I used to use methylene blue uh, because of two reasons. So one, a friend of mine brought me a bunch of eggs that were in heavy methylene blue a long time ago. Uh, they were green laser eggs. And I said, that's a lot of meth blue. Uh, but I said, well, I'm going to just change out, change it out over time before they hatch with tank water. And I, I did. And I had the water clear by the time the, the blue eggs hatched. And when the blue eggs hatched, they were, there were blue fish. So that tells me right there that that methylene blue is not coating the eggs, it's getting inside of the eggs. Uh, I also did a little bit of research on this and talked to a uh, micro, I think it's a microbiologist. Yeah, and he said that methylene blue, the point behind it is to alter the DNA of bacteria. And I've seen a lot of people who use methylene blue breeding their quarries having a lot of uh, deformities, whether it's eye deformities, spine deformities, gill deformities, um, head deformities. Uh, you see a lot of deformities with people who use methylene blue with their quarries. And he said that makes perfect sense because it's probably altering the DNA of the soft tissue as they develop. Uh, so methylene blue is a chemical and uh, I don't use it anymore. So, <laughs> okay. Um, a comment from Renee is something they do in Peru, uh, even though in Iquitos they have thousands of Indian almond leaves that were brought, you know, the trees were brought in mm -hmm. uh, by some of the uh, early Asian settlers. And so catapa leaves are everywhere. You have catapa yep. plants and trees everywhere. But one, one thing the exporters do is, is to get their water brown is they actually use tea bags. Yeah. In tea. Yeah. Um, my concern has always been um, with caffeinated products. Mm -hmm. Caffeine does affect uh, cell reproduction. You know, yeah. it stops, I don't want to get, you know, mm -hmm. technical, but it actually will stop a cell from reproducing. Mm -hmm. And so my view has always been to make sure you use decaffeinated mm -hmm. tea instead of regular caffeinated tea. Some of the breeders uh, we're talking about, I'm probably not saying it right, but I, uh, an herbal tea called Rooibos, I think it's a Rooibos, South yeah. African, yeah, yeah, South African one, and they said that they do use this, but they usually uh, run it through, you know, boiling water once or something, or you know, j just kind of, yep, there we go, Eric Thomas has got it, yep, and uh, um, yep, and it works uh, quite well, you know, to to darken the water, and I don't think it adds uh, too much caffeine or anything. Yep. So. Okay. Um, do you need to add alder cones if the eggs themselves come from a black water uh, tank? And That's then a good, you good convert question. the container to to clear water, or do you keep the tannins in that hatching water? Uh, so if I, it, you know, so with the macropterus, which are the one that I specifically, you know, breed in in black water, uh, that one. Um, I have had a few spawns where I didn't add anything at all because it is, it's got a lot of tannin soak. The eggs are getting stained by the tannins um, and it, they have hatched. Yeah, I haven't had any problems. I haven't had to add any alder cones. Uh, sometimes I do uh, with the macropterous tank. What I find is that the, the tannins 
you know, I have to really keep up on it if I want to keep that water dark. Uh, so the tannins leach out over time. So if I have them continue to spawn as I'm, you know, as the water is clearing out, then I will use alder cones. So, okay. but. Um, question that I have, mm -hmm. as a moderator, I get, <laughs> get in front of everybody, but I let some people go. Um, <laughs> how do you, how do you actually collect the eggs when they're on? Yeah. The front glass, side glass, or if they're on pieces of wood in your tank. I mean, yep. Does a razor yeah. blade actually harm the eggs at all, or what? Yep. So a razor blade can, you know. So I, I. That's why I kind of mentioned that I collect it with my fingers. Um, so one thing I should go over this real quick, and then usually I cover that in my talk. I'm trying to rush, uh, but the as I collect the eggs with my fingers, I let the eggs after they're laid, I let them be for at least usually an hour. Because if you try to go after an, an egg that was just laid, uh, the, it hasn't developed kind of a shell to it and it can pop real easily. So I let them go for about an hour at least and then I try to gather them with my fingers. There are cases where the egg is stuck to the glass too well. You know, especially with scleromystics, they it's almost like they're using super glue to stick them to the glass. Uh, so if I'm going to use a razor blade, I will go and try to just push on the glass and just slowly raise up. And and usually that works uh, and I don't damage the eggs. Uh, if I'm collecting them from wood or plants or other species where they're on the glass, usually I can kind of pinch them between my fingers. And if you're pinching the egg that's been laid and, and sitting there for over an hour and you pinch it and it pops, Chance are it wasn't fertilized because a good cori egg that's been fertilized, you can you can kind of squeeze it between your fingers a little bit and it's going to have a little give to it. It's not going to just burst. You don't want to push down real hard. Obviously, you know, you're strong enough to break any cori egg, but you know, just just gathering with your fingers, you shouldn't do much damage to it. And you know, I haven't had any problems. I don't have particularly oily skin or anything like that, you know, but uh, People have said that, aren't you worried about that? But I have pretty, you know, just dry skin or whatever, but um, I've never had any problems with that and, and collecting the eggs. The other thing I will note too, along with that, which a lot of people say, which is kind of a misnomer, I hatch almost all of my cori eggs in bright light. And so I've not found them to be photosensitive whatsoever, so. Okay, uh, Rob Paulson asked, does water change or lighting conditions affect breeding at all? Uh, so lighting conditions, as I mentioned, I only change that I've made is I kind of went from a 12 hour photo period to an eight hour photo period. And I haven't seen much change in the, uh, the breeding conditions with that, but I haven't experimented with it at all. Uh, water change. Yeah, definitely. You know, yeah. If you can, uh, you know, your water changes are, are one of the biggest things that can trigger them to spawn. So. Okay. Uh, Rich B asked, uh, do you add offspring to their to the parents tank to increase yeah. your colony, but do you worry about uh, genetic variation since we are then gonna have inbreeding occurring in, in that yeah. colony? Yeah, so um, do I worry about genetic variation? Not too, too much um, because I think fish are not like people, you know, we're, we're not going to, uh, have kissing cousins making, you know, <laughs> mutants or anything like that. They have a, a much different uh, uh, genetic makeup than we do. Um, so I don't overly worry about that. Uh, I, I think that um, uh, you have to be careful over time, you know, like, but most of these guys, I'm, I'm purchasing wild caught fish for the most part and breeding them. So, um, I don't usually you know, try to worry about it. I do, I, I purposefully add the juveniles back into the parents tank um, often uh, for one reason, and that's that they seem to grow better. Um, so I, I think that the parents may have um, gut bacteria that uh, they can pass to their offspring and help them digest food better and grow better. Um, so if you're trying to raise the fry in a completely sterile environment or whatever, I find that they, you know, they don't grow as well. Whereas if you throw them back in with the parents, they may grow, you know, twice as fast almost. So kind of interesting. Okay. Uh, he also asked, um, are there any spawning inducers for Corydoras pentanellus mm -hmm. uh, and equus? Sure. Okay. Uh, so I have, I will uh, be completely honest that I have not spawned either of these fish. Uh, but Corridors Equus, I can tell uh, one, the lady that I had first heard of spawning them was in Norway. And what she had done was uh, she had a, I think it was about 
the equivalent of a 30 gallon tank and she dropped the water down to half uh, and warmed it up. Uh, she kept the water warm and still very low water movement, very low filtration. Uh, she kept it like that for, I think it was three months. Um, and she fed them very sparingly, maybe two to three times a week with just some tablets uh, and not, not a lot, you know, just a couple. Uh, she then, you know, had, had, she had the water quite warm at that point in time. I think it was 84 degrees. And she then decided that she was going to end the dry spell. Uh, so she put cooler water from her zebra pleco tank, which was 80 degrees into the tank. And then, you know, started the filters up, got the current going again, and started giving them live worms, uh, live Daphne, a live baby uh, brine shrimp again, and they spawned like crazy for her. So that was Equus. Uh, the dry spell seemed to really work with her, and she did it with high temperatures. I've also heard of people doing the same thing with Equus with the other way around, doing extremely low temperatures. So they kept them at 67 or so uh, and lowered the water level, did all these things, and then raised the temperature up to maybe 75 and had the same thing. So Equus seemed to be a little bit flexible in that. Um, Pantanalensis, I know and have you know, heard the details of Regina Spotty, who's Eric uh, Bodrock's wife, uh, great couple, by the way, good friends. And Regina uh, with Pantanalensis, uh, did the same thing. She she didn't lower the water level, but she kept them in a fairly still tank, not you know feeding them maybe once or twice a week uh, for I think it was eight weeks, maybe longer, and then added them to a larger tank with faster moving water. And the other thing that Regina did was that she threw a handful of dirt in there, which caused kind of like a white water or a murky water. Uh, reaction. You have to be careful again where you get your dirt from and don't use too much, you know, like, but um, that, you know, with all that water movement and then the murky water condition, she got them to spawn. So, okay. Um, at what age or size do you move the fry to larger grow out tanks? Yeah, good question. So I kind of play it by ear. Um, I have actually raised, um, I, I've hatched out fish and kept them in that container for seven or eight days, that, that little specimen container I showed, then moved them to a five gallon tank. And if I have 14 or 16 fry, something like that, I can get them to nearly adult size in that five gallon tank. As long as I'm keeping up with my water changes, feeding them, and it's got good filtration, no problem. Um, if I have too many of them, obviously, if you get to larger numbers, then you got to play by ear. You know, you, if you if you sit there and say I've got 60 fish in a five gallon tank and now they've all reached one inch of size, yeah, it's time to move them to a bigger tank. Um, but you've kind of got to look at the fish and see, you know, okay, are they, you know, you got to see how many there are and and how big they are. So generally, if I had 60 fish in a five gallon tank and I raised them up to about two months old, I would move them to a bigger tank. Okay, so. that, that question was from Johan. Um, Beth has a similar question is that, uh, when do you move the fry to a sanded tank? You, you... Yeah, it's seven to eight days. Okay. Yeah. And so sometimes like, like with some of the hardier ones like Aspidors, it doesn't have to be a tank. Uh, so Aspidors, I'll put them in a plastic shoe box with a little sponge filter that's been running for a while and uh, they tend to do okay. But with the more sensitive species, I definitely try to get them to a glass five gallon tank at about seven or eight days, so. Okay, so Eric um, has a uh, comment which piggybacks off of someone else's question is Eric has seen white spot, quote unquote, white yeah. spot on his quarries that haven't been it, but he's seen white spot. Yeah. And, and so someone wants to know is, you know, if you do have diseases in your fish, uh, what's the best way to treat your fish? I got to, you know, do it based upon the disease. So, um, so what I tend to use, my standbys are, I use flu bendazole uh, for uh, an internal dewormer. Many of the long snout species uh, you know, have internal worms as they're coming in from being wild caught. Uh, there was a, a scientific paper done from Northeast Brazil where they looked at some of these long snout quarries and they found as many as 95% of the ones that they collected had internal worm-like parasites. Um, so I definitely with the long snout quarries, I typically uh, try to deworm them with this uh, uh, flu bendazole, not fenbendazole. Fenbendazole kind of has to be eaten, but flu bendazole, you can actually do it in the water.
there and it does a relatively good job of uh, deworming them. Um, so uh, that's my dewormer, my go-to dewormer. Um, I've had issues with Prazi, Quanto, um, and Metro. I've also heard and read that Prazi, Quanto, and Metro really have to be eaten to be effective. So I try not to use those if I can help it. Um, for antibacterial, I've used a uh, combination of canamycin and uh, nitrofurazone, uh, furan 2, and that seems to be a, a broad spectrum antibacterial attack that can take out a lot of bacterial diseases and you can use it together. Um, so you always, I always want to make sure that yeah, after you're done treating, uh, you're doing you know, big water changes, trying to get all that med out of the water and repetitive water changes. Um, other than that, for real mild stuff, uh, if they seem to have like a little tiny bit of, you know, fan rot or bacteria, small bacteria. I've used Melifix in the past. It's a very natural one. Um, you don't see a ton of external parasites on uh, quarries, but uh, I think I used uh, Life Bearer in a low dosage once to get rid of some fin worms that I saw on them. Um, the other thing that I find is there's a, a common... Um, white slime bacterial uh, infection that they get. And if they get that on the head of the body, I try to use the canamycin and nitrofurazone, uh, but it doesn't always work. If they, they get it on the fins, one thing you can do is take them out and use on a cotton swab, a little bit of uh, potassium permanganate, which is jungle clear water. You can dip a cotton swab and just dab their fin, which often kills that, that white uh, bacterial infection on the fins. But you don't want to do that on the body. You definitely don't want to get any in their eyes or gills because potassium permanganate in the bloodstream is toxic. So, uh, so, so we, we also have a... Um... A comment from Renee, uh, she says that for worms, you can also use a product that she calls Nistantina, Nistantina <laughs> which may be a South American product. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Or, uh, I've never heard of it here in the U.S. Yeah, I, I think Microbe Lift uh, might have put that out as a natural uh, cure a while back in the U.S. So, okay. yeah, I haven't seen it for a long time. Though, so. Okay. Uh, we have a question from Stag. Have you noticed if Corydoras egg de uh, deposition strategy depends upon their uh, habitat preference or uh, their genetics based upon that some species do it somewhere, you know, on leaves, others on rocks? Do, do you find any differences in deposition? Yeah, yeah definitely. Uh, so I noticed that the sclerostax types often do it high on the glass, which to me means that they're probably putting it, you know, on the riverbanks on some, some sort of a hard surface somewhere. Uh, could be a leaf, you know, could be a piece of wood or a rock. I don't know exactly what they're doing in nature, but to me, that's that's what it's kind of saying. Um, so for some of the long snouted quarries, specifically from the ones around Iquitos in Peru, I found a really neat technique, uh, which is to float a single a green yarn string along the top of the water, and they'll load that up with their eggs. I don't, they must use something that floats on the top of the water to lay their eggs in nature that's kind of string like. I did this because I caught them doing it. I had some algae, like some hair algae buildup, and I caught them loading that. Uh, hair algae string full of eggs. And I'm like, well, I wonder if I could just reproduce this with green yarn, you know, and sure enough, and it worked for uh, Corridorus coriatae, Corridorus fowleri, and Corridorus uh, semi-aquilus. They all would load a single green yarn string floating at the top of the water with eggs. So mm -hmm. um, there's, there's so many, I can't talk about them all, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. there's definitely, yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you purchase uh, alder cones, can you reuse them? I mean, is there any reason why? Yeah, you, well, you can, you can reuse them in a tank, you know, just to kind of add residual tannins or whatever, but I tend not to uh, reuse them for the, the spawning purposes because kind of once they've kicked off their original, you know, a bunch of tannins, the next time you try to use them, they're not going to kick off as much. Like if you dry them out and try to reuse them, it just won't be as much. Um, I haven't played around with it a lot, you know, like, but uh, yeah, I, I know it's definitely using used alder cones does not produce as much tannins. So Okay. Uh, Eric says, and, and you haven't mentioned it, but uh, what's your bucket list fit fish? What, what species do you want that you haven't gotten yet? Hmm. Uh, Let's see, there's a Brazilian one called CW83, which is a 
kind of a bluish long nose Cory with a gold stripe by its head. Uh, and that one I was, I, I had an opportunity to get it once, but it was prohibitively expensive. I'd like to try that one. Uh, and CW111, like as I mentioned, the, the kind of the zebra Cory, everybody wants to get a hold of that one. Uh, I'm actually pretty pleased with these CW146 that I have, and I showed the pictures of those. They're quite attractive, so honestly, I'd be satisfied with that. But I, given how easy CW111 are to spawn, I have a feeling that uh, they'll be the next uh, stir buy or whatnot. You know, so eventually, we're going to start seeing them everywhere, and the price will drop. So, okay. Um, Beth wants to know for eggs that come from black water tanks, mm -hmm. you convert those to clear water. Um, I just use the same, okay. try to use the same water that the okay. adults are in. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, and a question from Matt, and I will comment a little bit. You happen to have a reference for the gut micro uh, bacteria idea. Um, he says it just might be the parent tank have a better nitrogen cycle than a sterile tank. Let me interject something. Uh, for my PhD, I worked on uh, surgeon fish in the Red Sea. Uh, the surgeon fish um, at that time had described the largest bacteria known to mankind. Uh, and it is a gut microbe that breaks down plant material. And in those fish, um, you do find coprophagy in the juveniles. So the juveniles are picking up um, yep. the microbes mm -hmm. from um, from the waste products from the parents. Also, they do that in rabbits. Rabbits have the same process. Mm -hmm. So it's not un, you know it's not out of the realms of possibility that they can be picking up um, microbes from their parents. But mm -hmm. I have never seen a reference for that myself personally in my dealings with with gut microbes. Yeah, I, I don't, this is all anecdotal. <laughs> so yeah, unfortunately that, that portion for me is just what I've seen and, and what I'm going based upon is that as I'm breeding quarries, um, I will uh, have a spawn and then, uh, you know, maybe some months later or weeks later, I notice, huh, I missed an egg and there's a, or I missed a few eggs and there's a couple of fry that somehow managed to survive with the parents. And the ones that I have off here, you know, to this this tank and the five gallon tank, are much smaller than the ones that I have with the parents. So I just taking that as a cue, I started kind of when I'm trying to get them to grow a little faster, I throw them in with the parents, and sure enough, they do tend to grow a little faster. So with with when they're with the adult fish. So. Okay, a couple more. Uh, Johan wants to know what is your quarantine process for wild caught fish. So as far as the quarantine process goes, I. I'm kind of a breeder, you know, so, and I have a lot of tanks. So generally speaking, if I get a new group of quarries, I'm gonna be putting them in their own tank. So I don't have like a, a quarantine tank per, per se, you know, so they're they're immediately going into a tank where uh, they're the only fish in there. So, um, as, and what I tend to do at that point is is just kind of watch them, you know. So if, they, if I see, any bacterial, um, you know, I'll, I'll kind of watch it. If it gets, if it's light, then I will treat with the Melifex. If it looks bad, I'll treat it with the canamycin and nitrofurazone. Um, if I see flicking, like if I see they're, you know, they're kind of flicking on the sand and doing it on a constant basis, I'll usually try to deworm them with that flubendazole. Usually, if they're flicking like that, it's a sign that something's wrong on the inside. Um, so I'll try to, I'll try to treat them with that flubendazole. Um, other than that, you know, pretty much just try to keep them in their own tanks and, and, uh, monitor them and, and try not to treat them if I can help it. Cause many times the, uh, medicines are worse than, than not, you know, so the Melifix, uh, seems to be really natural. It doesn't do a whole lot. I've never seen it cure like a massive bacterial infection or anything like that, but for small things like, uh, the, you know, maybe that, uh, we had talked about in Eric's talk, the red blotch disease, or um, maybe some, a little tiny bit of fin rot uh, or a little bit of white, you know, spot like Eric was mentioning. Uh, dosing with Melifix every day for a week and then doing a big old water change can get rid of that, so. Okay. Um, do you ever use salt with your quarries? I have, maybe? yeah, just a, and I, I try to use really low amounts um, if, I, if I do. And usually that's something that if I see that they're sick with a, yeah, bacterial infection, I'll use like uh, maybe, 
maybe a teaspoon for 20 gallons, something like that. It's not, not very much, you know, and I just use aquarium salt. So it just, okay. just as a little bit of help, you know, so. And Rich B wants to know, do you ever use spawning mops? Yep. Yeah. So I use spawning mops. Um, some species use them way more than others. Um, I can specifically remember like duplicarious and whites when I put all their eggs in spawning mops and I used them like crazy. Uh, so you just have to kind of, you try it and see if they're using it, then great. Uh, Sclermistex, almost all the Sclermistex put their eggs on the glass, but then I got one pre notice and I had a mop in there and they use the mop. So it's, it's just, you just got to play it by ear. So yeah. Uh, do you have any experience? Um, um, Renee wants to know, she wrote to me in Spanish. Do you have any experience using hormones? In yeah, no. On, in no. Court? Yeah, I think that's cheating. So, yeah, I don't. Okay. Do. So, you're a, you're, you're a <laughs> hobby of purist, not a curious, yeah. money grubber, corridors producer. No. Okay. Yeah, no, it's, it's all part of the fun and the challenge, too. You know, I mean, you know, trying to replicate, you know, I'm not going to say natural, but as natural as you can get and try and get them to spawn or whatever. It's to me, it's a challenge. And, and I, I've gotten eggs from way more species than I say I've spawned, but I don't count it unless I've actually raised the fry, you know? So I, I know there's a number of breeders out there that say I've spawned 140 species, but the reality is, is they may have gotten eggs from 140 species, but there's no evidence that they've produced fry from that many. Um, so I, I really try to, I am, I am a purist in that way. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah. Um, uh, next to the last question is, uh, do you have any spawning hits, hints for sure. Brocus Brocus Splendens? Yeah, yeah. So Broca Splendens, uh, so my buddy that was spawning those, uh, he was keeping them in a low flow, um, 40 gallon breeder tank that was his Pleco uh, breeder tank. So they were getting a lot of pellet food in this low flow 40 breeder tank. So they had a lot of room, you know, to run around. Uh, there was a lot of food, but it wasn't um, uh, live and it wasn't really frozen. Uh, so when he wanted to spawn them, he would put them up into a high flow five gallon tank with a batten filter. And then with that batten filter, he'd tie a spawning mop to the kind of to the outflow of the batten filter. So the spot, the green spawning mop would be flowing with its strings out in that flow. And he'd really turn up the, the water movement, you know, especially for a five gallon tank. I was really kicking. And then he'd feed them with live black worms and I think frozen blood worms. And he doesn't use baby brine shrimp. So that was pretty much it, you know, live black worms and, and frozen blood worms. And uh, I think I, he did do Daphne. He had, he had live Daphne. And uh, he, yeah, he'd get them to lay a lot of eggs and he'd almost be able to do it on command. So yeah, it worked very well. So. Please read my, your, my direct message to you, Eric. I mean, uh, Eric, Rob. Mm -hmm. Oh. Oh yeah. Nope. Yep. Yep. Here. I'll oh, even. I'll Rob's even going to put his email address in chat um, in case anybody else uh, has any more questions. Uh, I have a few other things to um, to uh, oh, I do see. also here, um, and that is. I, 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 there we go. Mm -hmm. So you're welcome. Thank you. Um, so what I'm going to do, uh, so here's some contact information. I hope everybody can see it. Rob, give me a thumbs up if you can see the, okay. So um, our website is amazonresearchcenter.org. Uh, we do have a Facebook site that's facebook.com Amazon Research Center. Um, we do have a YouTube page uh, where we post videos of uh, what we're doing at the Research Center in Peru, and you just go to youtube.com and type in Amazon Research Center for Ornamental Fishes. Um, and that, uh, and um, our, uh oh, okay, our, uh, um, we, we are an, a nonprofit. Uh, we run off donations. Uh, one way you can donate to Amazon Research Center is very easy if you use amazon.com a lot to buy your purchases. Uh, you use their sister site, uh, Smile Amazon. It's the normal Amazon site. And what they do is they uh, do, uh, they donate some of their proceeds. So it doesn't come out of your pocket. Some of their proceeds to your um, 
your nonprofit of choice and there's you know all the nonprofits out there are are uh, part of smile of course we'd like you to do amazon research center uh, as your charity but i would say you know if you could go to your favorite charity and and select that favorite charity but we hope your favorite charity is amazon research center